Behind the Notes, the official Music Notes podcast. Conversations with professionals throughout the music industry. With your host, Lucas Kaler. All right, welcome Jillian, Hello. podcast number three. Oh yeah, of know. our little mini-sodes here. I know, seriously, I like these mini-sodes. <laughs> yeah, these they're fun good. To do. They are fun to do. We get to kind of goof off and explore. Yeah, hopefully people like... Company. Yeah, people can listen to these like in on car rides, like mm-hmm. just kind of short little things, or while you're yep. cleaning the house, or <laughs> yeah, no, exactly, yeah, totally. Uh, so today, I wanted to ask you, I wanted to talk a little bit about private instruction because I think a lot of musicians do that. I know yeah. I did it for years, and um, I know you've been doing it for how long now? Um, probably a couple of years, two or three years. Okay. I've been doing it. So, I kind of did it like on and off a little bit when oh, I was okay, in college, sure. but since graduating, like only kind of, you know, like consistently for a couple, two okay. or three years. Were you yeah. doing it during college? Or? <clears throat> you know, I had a couple of instances where I would have like specific people ask me if I mm. taught. And so I would kind of give lessons to maybe like one person at a time, but oh, it was okay. more informal. Like I wasn't yeah. like, I didn't have a bunch of regular students or anything. I would sure. just kind of, if one of my friends was like, oh, I really like want to learn, you know, more about voice or something. Do you oh, teach? Nice. Then yeah. I would like give them lessons for a month or something or okay, sure. something like that. It's excellent <laughs> experience when you're in college. It really it's is. It's so good. Um, yeah. I know I started teaching kind of for a living right around the time I graduated and, uh, Going back and reteaching all the stuff I learned in my undergrad, it yeah. just solidified so much of that information. That's I mean, a it great was point. crazy. Yeah, I, I, uh, I really do think most musicians, particularly if you're going any kind of academic route, such as going to college for it, um, mm-hmm. should spend some time instructing. It just, it, it you get so yeah. good with the information by explaining it to other people, and you kind of have to go back through and, and understand it yourself. That was very yeah. much what I found most valuable. No, ex- yeah, I've had I had the exact same experience. I think realizing how much I knew theoretically, mm. but maybe not enough about to fully understand it too because then once you go to explain a topic especially to to more advanced students although it's still super valuable going back and revisiting the basics but to to realize oh wait a minute i you know i know theoretically how this works Mm. but it takes a whole other skill set to be able to explain it right and And, represent it and and represent it show someone else how to do it yes exactly so it's given me i feel like a deeper understanding of a lot of topics because i've had to go back and kind of like look look back and be like what does this really mean and when someone asks me like what's the origin of this term i'm like Mm -hmm. I don't know, or stuff stuff like that, or just, like you said, just really solidify my knowledge yeah. of the topics. So it's really cool. It's benefiting, you know, you, you think of private instruction as, private music instruction as a teacher is teaching the student. Sure. And that, that relationship of, like, student is there to learn and mm-hmm. teacher is there to give the information. <laughs> but it's cool when it ends up being like, oh, actually, the teacher is learning from it as well right exactly yeah Yeah. it's kind of more of a conversation than even than like a you know fully teacher student right i know better than you you do this (laughs) right yeah 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 Yeah. well and you get to explore all the different ways to approach a topic you know we kind of talked about it in our last podcast with um what the editors do at music notes you know there could be three four different right ways you just got to kind of find the right way given the context. And I think that the same right. goes for when you're, when you're teaching your, your private students. Um, how many yeah. students do you have now? Uh, I have about eight or nine okay. right now. That's plenty. Yeah. Is it all yeah, piano, piano or piano voice? Piano and voice. Yep. Nice. Yep. And it was all, it's all in person or yeah, it's all in person right now. As I'm teaching, I used to teach some more students online also, okay, but sure. I moved to just kind of in person online mm-hmm. is really hard. I think it's super useful that we can teach online, but yeah. I enjoy more teaching in person when I can. I I agree. You can you can get the job done. Yeah. And I don't I wouldn't say that I didn't find it valuable f- uh, for the students that I taught online. I mean, yeah. it seemed like they still were able to progress. But they, yeah, there's something about being in the room. I like a hybrid. I think yeah. if you can work that out, that's a really, really nice way to do it. Right. Um, yeah. How many students did you ever have? At a well, it's, I, you know, I did it for about 10 years. So uh, the yeah. numbers wow. varied. The most I think I ever got up, I think I got to 50 a week. I, 50, I, I had a wow. lot. Yeah. And I was because I was that teaching. That was full time too, right? Like you're pretty I mean, much doing half that hour lessons, that's only 25 hours a week. Yeah. But it yeah. felt like 40. And yeah. then, yeah, I was performing and touring and stuff during that time so 
when you add it up, I was doing yeah. 50 hour work weeks pretty regularly. Wow. <laughs> um, and fortunately, I really enjoyed doing it. Um, but I did, you know, I found it really interesting. Uh, the private teaching was exhausting sometimes. Mm -hmm. Like I, I used to work on a farm. OK, I could do eight, nine hours on a farm. I get home. <laughs> I'm tired, but I'm OK. I do four or five hours of teaching and my brain just it yeah. felt like jello. It was wild. Mm -hmm. You know, it really um, I needed to go home. I needed to sit and be quiet. And I needed to have a meal. I needed to have a lot of water and then I could kind of go and continue my day. But uh, yeah, for some reason, mentally, I found it very exhausting. Um, yeah, no, I think there's something to that, because even like I, I really love it, but it is every time I get done teaching for a stretch, mm -hmm. I have to sit and take a really kind of pause, a, yeah. just a break, just to reset my mind. I think it's because, I mean, if you think about it, like, so then going to like this common structure of these private lessons, mm -hmm. like a lot of the times, like you said, they're 30 minutes right. long. So if you have, I mean, if you have 10 students in a row for a day mm -hmm. at 30 minutes, that's only five hours. Right. But every 30 minutes, it well every chunk of 30 minutes is really intense time yes. focused on that one student and right. explaining concepts and then usually like at least for me there's not really a break in between right. no, you exactly. just go one to the next mm -hmm. and then you're completely switching teaching styles because right. each person is different mm -hmm. so i think it's really a brain kind of a, a, a complicated you know brain exercise right, to have sure, okay sure. for this half hour you're doing this then completely switch gears right and like from person to person from different age ranges mm -hmm. and it's just a, and skill a lot. levels and you know, skill levels yeah, based, yeah some people are just going from the very beginning some people are a little more inter intermediate yeah. i even had some some players that were very very good and you know working on even just being able to jump from a very very basic lesson with maybe a young person to a much more complex lesson oh, with an older person. I mean, yeah, getting your mind into that new gear can yeah. be really, really difficult. Um, yeah. It was rewarding. Don't get me wrong. I feel like oh, we're just yeah. talking about the bad stuff, you know? I always, <laughs> it's awful. No. Yeah, right? I used Definitely to love not. watching, particularly once you get to the recitals and stuff and you see how yeah. much work they put into it and then where they landed, you know? Yeah. And, like, watching them get comfortable uh, performing at the recital. You know what I mean? Like, you know, they're a little bit nervous, but then they get yeah. up there and they do what they know how to do. And, and, uh, um, all of a sudden, you know, mom and dad are freaking out and they, they're watching their kid yeah. go do this thing. They've, they've seen them work on for months. Um, and actually present it to a group of people and do so calmly and professionally in that. That's that's the rewarding stuff. That yeah, I no, absolutely. And you I know. think something like stage fright is kind yeah. of something that can span across all ages. Oh, and yeah. so yeah, a everybody big, gets it. Yeah, everybody gets it. And mm -hmm. especially like I've had I've taught a lot of different beginner musicians, but of, of different ages. So oh, and, sure. and to see the similarities between my five year old that's never performed before and like mm -hmm. is really scared to get on stage and my 45 year old who has never really performed before and is worried about getting up and performing right. in these sure, recitals. Sure. And so I think yeah. a big part of lessons, too, can sometimes be like you were saying, just have like encouraging kind of developing those just skills as a human being mm -hmm. of yeah, being able absolutely. to, I mean, it's the same, it's kind of the same thing as like public speaking or, you know, yeah. something like that. Right, just exactly. getting the courage to present yourself and then how to do it you like professionally mm -hmm. and kind of, it's, it's cool to see a bunch of different people in, in age, you know, just personality, but everybody kind of overcome that if they, if they, mm -hmm. if they have that fear, but even if they don't sure. like just get more comfortable performing, I, I found playing. most people I ever met have that fear. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah, I definitely agree. So. I found the same thing, yeah. but yeah, it's, it's, but it is interesting when you, yeah, have to switch your brain from, okay, I'm teaching my six year old, just like how to position their hands at the piano right, and like right. to not, you know, say nonsense on stage and then switch your mind to, okay, my older advanced student, like now I'm going into, you know my key signatures and like mm -hmm. <laughs> you know yeah. more complicated stuff so yeah absolutely but yeah and you taught so you taught primarily bass and did you teach other instruments i, I actually taught primarily guitar and piano oh um, you did yeah oh, so my degrees are in bass, bass. I, taught, I had a handful of students uh <laughs> yeah on bass but it, there's just not the the uh the wealth of students you know yeah. people don't necessarily think to send their kid to to bass lessons you know what i mean mm -hmm. um I got a number of bass students from, uh, I had people that would bring me very young kids who wanted to play guitar. 
and I would give them a couple lessons and guitar is really, 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 really hard. <laughs> like yeah. it's really difficult to get going. Whereas bass is actually pretty easy to get going on. And so a lot of times I would encourage them, Hey, can we try some bass lessons with these kids? Let's, let's, uh, start them there. You know, it's just a blown up version of the lowest four strings of a guitar anyway. You know what I mean? It, it'll, um, right hand depending on how you do it if you sometimes i would teach them with a pick otherwise i would teach them actual bass technique with the right hand yeah um but at least get your left hand going and it teaches you when you're playing a stringed instrument your two hands are doing completely different things so like on piano they're doing similar things it's not that it's easy but they're similar movements you know what i mean um you're holding your hands in the same way you're using individual fingers you're playing chords you're you're to doing thumb under uh, middle finger over to go up and down scales things like that um with a stringed instrument particularly guitar oh my gosh your left hand has got to be extremely nimble and, and able to hit mm-hmm. multiple strings at a time chord shapes as well as individual notes you got to be able to move up and down the neck all while your right hand is doing something completely different and that could be really really challenging for particularly young people i found um, yeah so yeah, so I would get a lot. I would I would try and catch a lot of them young and be like, "You want to play bass anyway, you know?" But I did it. I did it with adult beginners. <laughs> Why don't we start too. here? <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. I I did do it with adult beginners and yeah. uh, and then yeah, a lot of piano students, lots and lots of piano students. Uh, yeah, which it's I probably the most enjoyed. most popular. I one. think so. Yeah. yeah, it's a great place to start. I mean, yeah. even when people would want to start guitar. I always kind of recommended at least some piano on the side, you know, just just to get going there. It's it's an amazing right. uh, amazing way to just start getting the layout of Western harmony in your mind. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. It's, it's a very it, there's a, a real it's easy to kind of see things visually on a piano. That's that it's a good point. Rather on like on a guitar, you're looking at a graph and imagining a series of plotted yeah. points. You know, and what that's I mean? what's been hard for me to go like I really want to start learning guitar, and I've tried oh, a sure, couple sure. times or just had I mean not formally, but had people show me mm. some chords and stuff, and I'm trying to after being a pianist, it's a little difficult because it's basically like you're playing a piano, but the entire format of the piano is rearranged. Yeah, right. So it's been a little hard for me to be like, wait, I don't... Because the way that you can have multiple positions to play, or you can play the same note on different strings, Mm -hmm. it's so hard to reorient the your view right. of the linear piano after right, exactly. it being hammered into you for so long that's a good point that's but, a really good point yeah but i've also heard that people say it's easier to learn guitar once you've learned piano yeah i would agree so with i that. don't know you would agree with that i yeah. started with piano and then yeah. moved to guitar later on i did okay. have bass pretty well under my hands at the time so guitar is kind of yeah. a combination of those two instruments in a lot of ways you know like left hand technique that you might use on a bass with right uh the complex polyphony of a piano you know what i mean um so yeah i think that maybe the familiarity with the two might have helped me a little bit um and i i found some really good books actually early on um uh books i ended up using uh when i was teaching kids uh guitar particularly and just there's a million method books out there uh, that are mm-hmm. really, really, they'll start you at the most basic function of what you're trying to do in the first place. We actually just put a bunch on the site. I mean, you know about this, but yeah. uh, um, we just, we've started pumping out digital music books and it, I think we're kind of, we've hit a critical mass now where we've yeah. got a lot of them and a lot of instruction books. It's going to be really cool. Yeah. 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 It's, I mean, that's, that's the same. I remember even, I mean, I teach out of method books right now, yeah, sure. but then I also remember I, I learned from method books too, starting from when I was six mm, on mm-hmm. piano. Yeah, and I remember right. doing that. And even as I got more advanced, I was still kind of learning from method books for like the theory concepts and stuff. Yes, and then my yeah. performance pieces, my teacher would help me like maybe find like, here's a, you know, Chopin piece that's more at your level, but that could go hand in hand with what you're learning right now in your method book, right. which is cool. So yeah, those were super helpful as a student and now mm-hmm. as a teacher, I think equally as helpful. So, well, and that's what's nice uh, with all the different method books, particularly a lot of the ones that we we've we're, we've been putting on the site lately. We've got a lot of these different technique books, so it's mm-hmm. not just repertoire books, which there's a ton of them now. Um, and one of the things I actually really like about it, it's all digital because, you know, yeah. music notes, everything's digital. So it's not like you got to order a book and wait for it in the mail or mm-hmm. uh, go to a store to buy the book. You just get the book the moment you buy it, you know, yeah. right online, which is so nice. And it's uh, really cool. Um, 
yeah, we've got all kinds of books. Like, like there's like sight. I was looking at some of the sight reading books recently, and I kind of mm-hmm. forgot that there were even method books for sight reading. You know, to teach yeah. you the proper techniques for it. I have forgot. I had forgotten that also. I do yeah. remember I did that also as a piano student yeah. growing up. Probably not as much as I should have because I'm really bad at sight reading <laughs> now. But <laughs> not easy. Not <laughs> you either piano. get sight reading or the ear. Maybe yeah, that's sure. what. And I got the ear and not the sight reading oh, ability. Sure, sure. But yeah, no. But those those they're really helpful though. Like even. Like I even have some old ones at home that I have just kind of wanted to brush up on sight reading skills yeah. and pull them out. And you can just go through the book song by song and the intensity just gets like harder as you go. It's just all laid out for you right. in a book. Right. So yeah, yeah exactly. those are really cool. Yeah, no, it ramps you up. It's it's story structure. Yeah, yeah. Right? Like Doesn't it just throw you in. Because otherwise I would just try to pick a random piece and be like, oh, right. I guess we'll see if I can play this. Right. But <laughs> it's not always the most encouraging when you realize you can't play this. That like, does feel like the voice <laughs> in your brain when that comes up too. It's just kind of it's like, well, I guess I'll just do uh, this. I guess I could just see if I, I play don't this. Understand, but yeah, <laughs> no, exactly. And it's hard now. I mean, now I'm not in lessons that y- you have to structure your own practice time, yeah. which is hard. But it is. But it's, it's cool when you have hard. resources like this. Yeah, and right. then on Music Notes, it being digital, and you can just hit purchase, bam, you got it. Yeah. You can just pull it up. Well, and then the next thing that we're rolling out, we've been working on it, and it seems like it's coming together pretty well, is the um, we're making them interactive. You know, yes. so like our sheet music that if you buy an individual piece, you get playback, you get MIDI playback, which is great, and you can adjust things, and it um, uh, the notes will highlight as it's being played and stuff. It's hard to find music books that will do that and they mm-hmm. our tech team you know those guys they're ama- what an amazing team um they've they've set it up to where we can have that kind of playback with with a lot of the books that are that are out there um yeah and i find that super duper helpful with the practice super helpful because sure. i think about like when i was teaching particularly piano students and early readers um We'd be going note by note, and I'm using a pen, and I'm pointing at every single note as it's <laughs> yeah. time for them to play. I mean, you've done this, right? Yeah. And I'm not around to do that when they're practicing at home. This mm-hmm. is kind of the the interactive part that we have with the music books now is, is sort of making up for that, which is really, really cool. Super advantageous. Yeah. And uh, you can adjust tempos. Uh, there's a really cool like uh, markup feature so you can highlight parts it's got a highlighter it's got a pen you can circle things it's got a text so you can write yourself notes i think of how many notes right. i used to write in people's uh oh uh, yeah on people's mark sheet all music up. all yeah. over yeah it's really easy to mark up and save so um no we've had a lot of teachers who have been who have been buying these books now and using them on their ipads and that and teaching the kids that way yeah. and uh uh, you do have to download the midi separately is part of it um the because the markup and the uh, um uh, playback is all in the apps and mm-hmm. so you could put it on your ipad you can put it on your phone uh you you so you download you down buy your song download the song download the audio with it and then bam it's all right there and you just can click on any given exercise and it'll just play it back for you and you can do yeah. it over and over and over again it's super helpful yeah that's no that's really cool like yeah, for yeah like for that people feature. that yeah so we i mean because we have a bunch of music on i mean obviously on our site just a bunch of individual arrangements you can buy and that's kind of been you know our the driving force of what music notes is is you can you know we have such a vast library but yeah to have these books it's really cool for people in lessons or for teachers because i i even remember and like to have this yeah interactive feature i i remember i have a student right now that's like this and i was like this too when i was learning but I, we would be going through these big lesson books that my teacher gave me. And I am a very like, by ear learner. Yeah, like sure, if I sure. had to choose, I would not choose to read mm-hmm. music. I would do it by ear, even though I can read music because I learned for right. so long. But what would happen then as I was learning how to read music is maybe I had heard the song and I would go by my ear, but then the arrangement wouldn't be like the version that I heard by ear. So I would maybe learn oh, a measure sure. or two, like yeah. like wrong, I guess. Right. Because, I mean, like it could have still been the song, but like if this is a different arrangement and I'm not going off of the actual notes. So then I, I could have learned it a little bit off of the sheet music just because I'm like, oh, I know what this sounds like. And yeah. it just kind of sticks in your brain. And then you practice that over and over again. Mm-hmm. And then I would get to my lesson and my teacher would be like, no, look at this measure. You have to, there's an extra note that you're like playing or oh, sure. you're not playing this, just like little things. Mm-hmm. And then I'm like, oh, but this, having the interactive 
feature having being able to hear it back Mm -hmm. that would have avoided i would have avoided that because i would have heard if i could play along with you know the exercises or whatever then i would have immediately realized like oh my ear i was relying on my ear for that measure it's actually different and then i would have been able to kind of put that That's together. A really good point. Yeah. Kids are so in the lucky moment. nowadays. I know. New students right? are so lucky. We didn't get that growing up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Totally. No, that's a good point. It is a nice feature for that. Um yeah, I always love the MIDI playback that you can get. Uh yeah. cuz like you said, yeah, you might hear something wrong or maybe it's even your exact arrangement but somebody's embellishing it. So then you get yeah. that wrong thing in your ear. Exactly. Well, wrong's not the word, but you know what I mean. Not yeah, the way yeah, you're yeah. supposed to be playing it. Right. Um, Different. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a super, super cool feature. And I was looking through the list the other day. I mean, there's so much classical music. There's so much jazz. These are all books, method books yeah. or just repertoire books um, and technique books. But yeah, all kinds of pop stuff, jazz stuff. Uh, the sight reading stuff, I really, really like those. The ear training books are cool. Mm-hmm. I found a bunch of like mandolin books. I mean, it's yeah, like an I saw endless, a banjo on there. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of an endless. It's kind of an endless list. It's yeah. really, really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, no, I'm excited. Yeah. For, for, for to get more, we're trying to get more partners too. Uh, we've for been sure. working on that now. Uh, yeah, the goal more. is right to just kind of get more and more added as time right. goes on, right? Yeah, just be constantly expanding. Right, exactly. That library. Yeah, that's the idea. Yeah, so no, but that's it's going, awesome. it's going good. Yeah, I'm really excited to see where those, uh, yeah, where those go, and I love seeing the teachers. I've met a few teachers now who have been using the digital music books and they're just raving about how well it works for the students and and there's even some good ones for like uh adults trying to learn on their own you know i i I always advocate for if there's anything in this world you're trying to learn find somebody who knows how to do it and go ask them how to do it Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know but at the same time some of your own research and your own study really is it matters you know it's it's very very helpful and the more familiar you can be uh before you ask somebody kind of the more advantageous their advice will be uh, so yeah, totally. these, these books are a great place to start with that. Yeah, no, that's a great point about if you're in, an adult or, you know, even teenager trying to learn yeah. on your own, right. um, you can have like, if, if up until now you've just been kind of buying pieces that you've wanted to play off music notes, yeah. now you can have like an actually, uh, structured book in the same right, place as you have you. all those yeah exactly. yeah so it's it's cool because you'll probably i mean like if you have the the app too like i people use ipads now so much for, yeah, reading, for reading music oh, yeah I see it, like every concert i go to yeah so the like the the music notes on on the app you can view your entire library of everything you've purchased right. so you can view you can be working on your book and then just quickly click off of it and then go click on a different piece that you're working on right. so it'll be really cool to you know see people using the, both those functionalities and mm-hmm. kind of just together i think they'll co- they complement each other nicely they so do. as more people yeah get to view these digital music books i'm i'm really excited about the yeah opportunity for educators learners everybody Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely i was i was using it um we've all been messing around with the free song this month we're giving away the the, uh the main theme the exposition from the mozart sonata 11 the andante andante grazioso grazioso that's it oh man i should have written that down no you're right that's what it is andante grazioso uh but yeah so i've been using the midi playback to to help learn that myself yeah. because it has been so long since i actually went and tried something of merit on piano right you know, I well can we can we sing the melody to that there's nothing against that yeah right? no we just so like it. people yeah, it's know it's the song that goes da 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 yeah yeah it's no, that it's one super if you, pretty so one. you know what we're talking it's, about it's the sonata that has uh uh the last movement of it is the rondo alla turca which is super famous mozart oh, super yeah. duper famous mozart i didn't know that was in the same um, sonata yeah That's yeah cool. no it's a very it's it's one of his more famous ones i believe but uh yeah so the the i was looking at what we're giving away free this month and we're giving the main theme for that away and it's on like piano there's guitar version there's c instrument there's a uh, uh, bass clef instrument you know there's lots of versions of it so yeah. like uh, uh julia who works with us she and i did a bass and violin duet of it um 
our CFO, uh, Dan Heiliger, he, when he, they were visiting yeah. Nashville last week, he, he's an excellent sight reader. So uh, yeah. we did a really cool video of him performing it, which was really neat. Oh, yeah. I haven't seen the video yet, but I, I cool. heard him because, yeah, they were here visiting from headquarters. And I, yeah, because we had Tim Pants South last week. Yeah, which yeah. was so fun. But oh, I could, so I remember cool. hearing him for just working on my computer up up here and mm-hmm. listening. I could hear the piano faintly in the background. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh I know. It's I was super like, lovely. that's Dan playing. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. No, I loved how, how I felt like I kept hearing it from different places around yes. the office because everybody's talking about it. Basically, you can't it. escape this song. Right. Now, yeah, exactly. If you work here. So, so yeah, <laughs> it's ingrained in my ears at this point. And for me, too, I was, I was telling Maddie, who also works here, I was telling her, I, that song I'm pretty positive was on one of the baby Mozart tracks that I would listen to oh, as a little it. baby. That like my parents played, yeah, my parents played me so much of those baby sure. Mozart things. And I, that song, when I hear it now, I don't know. It's probably because that was like my like calm music. Like they would put me in my crib and play me baby Mozart. Oh, sure, and when sure. I was hearing that all over the office, I was just like, I, my eyes would start to just close. And I was like, Oh, that's really oh I'm just ready to go to bed. I'm like, no, I have to work. I have to, it's, you know, two o'clock on a Monday. I can't be falling asleep. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. But you guys, yeah, you guys were soothing me, right? To a state uh, of relaxation. Well, it's so pleasant. And uh, actually that's really cool that you say that your parents played that for you because if yeah. nothing else, that's a really good example of like sonata form. Um, mm-hmm. And so that kind of ingrains that in your, in your brain, you know, the, uh, the uh, exposition, the development, the recapitulation, uh, it's, those are kind of the three main sections of a, of a movement um, yeah. that, that, mo- that, uh, form gets kind of blasted into your subconscious. You know what I mean? So then True. you always kind of hear, when because songs even like pop songs and jazz songs kind of have that sort of thing going on it's not exactly the same and and uh so many classical musicians have written sonatas and kind of ex- expanded upon that form a little bit or adjusted that form or extended or shortened those forms something yeah. like that um because this one i think i'm pretty sure the first movement here i think it has six uh six development sections uh oh, okay. where it takes the main theme and just kind of elaborates on it and replays it. Most of it's in six eight, but what's really cool is the very the, the recapitulation section at the very end goes to four four, and so oh. having the all this development being in six, and then all of a sudden dropping calm in time. I don't know. There's sort of this. Um, you want to talk about relaxation? There's this tension yeah. relief, you know, because four four is as, as comfortable as as music can be as far as time signatures go, and it's not that six eight is uncomfortable necessarily, right. but but to transition from that and still make it work, and he's using um, uh, there's a lot of like tripleted figures in the left hand throughout. Um, mm-hmm. So then to just, just kind of all of a sudden take it and make it duple and straighten it up, it's it's such an, a a really it's so comfortable. I don't know how else to say that. You know what I mean? There's yeah. so much tension that's relieved and you you just get to kind of relax and hear, be reminded of the original melody that you heard in the exposition. That's what the recapitulation is. It's kind of getting closer to the original melody and kind of reminding the listener of where we started. Right. Um, yeah. No, that's just, just the stuff that I love about this piece. Yeah. No, that's really cool. It's just no. kind of like a a breath of fresh air just at the exactly. end of changing time signature. So is that is that common, do you know, in sonata form? Or does uh, to, it, do to, sonatas to, to change time signatures? Yeah. I don't believe that it is. Yeah. And now now don't get me wrong, some people with more expertise than me might might yeah. have a better answer to I know, that. I'm like, I, I don't believe it is though. No. Yeah. I feel like that was relatively uncommon, which is one of the things that makes Mozart so special. You know right. what I mean? Yeah, and that theme that just sticks in your head mm-hmm. so much. And there's so m- so much melody. music he's written that's like that that just right. it just never leaves your mind. Right. But then so we have that on the site, right? For mm-hmm. multiple for a multiple instruments. Yeah, basically almost any instrument you could p- want to play it on, there's something on there. That's and it's awesome. all yeah, and for free. Right, exactly, cuz we give away a free song every month. Um, yeah. so yeah, no, I think you just go to the uh, you just go to the website and what's free? You know, free song of the month. There's pic- there's pictures of it all over the place. Like we've yeah. actually tons of people have been downloading it so far. It's pretty early That's in cool. April Well, still. yeah. Oh my gosh, uh, if you if you play it and if you download it and learn it on your instrument, please tag yeah. us on on socials. That would be super cool. That yeah, would be like really that. cool. We'd love to see it cuz yeah. I've yeah, now I've heard the piano, I've heard the violin and bass duet no. and yeah, I, I want to hear more cuz There's a really cool uh guitar version of it, classical guitar version on the site Ooh. that I really want to hear somebody play. Oh. 
All that right, anyone be... out there, if you play classical know, guitar, serious. please make a video and tag us. <laughs> oh, no, that would be awesome. That'd be super cool. That'd be huh? really cool. If anybody's see. got a forte piano, too, uh, you know, oh, that's what yeah. it was originally written for. That's right, forte the forte piano. piano. Um, did I tell you when I was in my undergrad, I had an ear training teacher who had, he and his buddy would, I guess, get blueprints for like harpsichords and forte pianos from museums and then build them themselves and then bring it in to do ear training on. Um, so yeah, no, I actually what? got to play a forte piano a couple of times, which but like was a really brand, cool. like a newly, like a newly built? constructed one. Yeah, it was Whoa. made, it was made of wood. It had the very thin strings and, uh, um, this is nobody quote me on this, but my understanding is forte piano. Basically what they did was they took a harpsichord. They got rid of the, uh, uh, the quills that pluck the strings on the harpsichord. Right. And then replaced them with hammers, wrapped them in leather and had them hitting the same strings. So it's not like a modern oh. piano, which has got all these like metal and steel parts, um, it was it so it was a much quieter, much more gentle. The whole thing's made of wood. It's got very thin strings, but it did still have the the hammer mechanism on it. Um, right. And so it's it, 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 it's such a gentle sound. It it sounds yeah. like a piano. It reminds you of a piano, but it doesn't. But it's not a piano. It's really not. I don't know. Do you think it's somewhere in between, like a harpsichord sound and a piano sound? I, I think so. Yeah. yeah. I think just because of the thinness of the strings. Um, the the hammers make a huge difference. The hammers, yeah. in my mind, send us a little closer to the sound of of a piano, of a modern piano, right. than a harpsichord. Because harpsichord's got that that plucked string sound. Yeah. Um, which I will say is amazing for ear training because you want to talk about being in tune. I mean, that's like if your harpsichord is tuned up, the mechanism of, of literally plucking the string just gives you this perfect straight harmonic sound wave. Um, yeah. Hearing intervals, they're just, they were so, so pure and clear. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was a really cool instrument to do ear training on for sure. Um, yeah, that's interesting because you know. I never did formal ear training on mm. like from from a harpsichord, but I sure. grew up, my piano teacher had a harpsichord. Really? Yeah. Oh, and for, so cool. for each, I think it was for almost every recital, mm -hmm. we would have we would have to pick one piece or actually it may be but it maybe would have been the summer ones. I don't oh, okay. remember exactly. But like we had a stretch where we would learn a bunch of pieces by different classical um, composers like from each uh, period so like the classical period the romantic period like sure. blah 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 and it, one of those we would have to play on the harpsichord one of them that like suited the harpsichord or was like originally oh, written for harpsichord yeah, like something baroque era probably. yeah something baroque yeah. yep mm -hmm. and there were a lot like I remember I played an invention too one sure. time on, on the harpsichord but I remember too there's a switch on the harpsichord you can turn it like it's almost like the That's uh right. there it's is. almost like a snare drum how you can turn it like on or off like there's a switch oh, so you I can know have what you're it talking about too yeah and i i i just this just popped into my head sure. i wasn't even thinking about this before but i remember having that kind of you can play it on that sound where each note rings out or you can turn it off turn the switch off and it or maybe on i don't know which way you mm, would call it mm -hmm. but and it almost sounds like you're playing pizzicato strings or something well yeah it's no now that muted. you're saying this oh man we need somebody on the youtube comments to explain this but i feel yes. like there was a mechanism where you could have it pluck one string or two strings maybe that's what it is and the two strings were the same pitch uh, that that might and be. So what, I think that's the is. way it filled out the sound. Ooh, somebody somebody needs to yeah, comment. Yeah, if there's on a this harpsichord one. expert, uh, please let us. know. I know. Seriously. Maybe we should do an episode on researching the inner workings of a harpsichord. I'm totally down to do that. Actually, yeah. it's uh, I have not even thought about harpsichord in quite some time. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. No, that's really cool. Or maybe maybe even like the history of the piano. Maybe we could mm -hmm. look back and see like kind of just I'm, from know. harpsichord to forte piano sure. to piano. Because I don't. I would love to know more about yeah, that. Yeah, really. No, but, it's it's neat. It's it's the, the way that keyboard instrument has progressed in its in its lifetime or whatever is, is super really cool. interesting yeah, yeah yeah well i definitely want to hear i love the idea of if people want to uh record the mozart grab the mozart off the website yeah. it's just the, just the main theme just the first part you don't got to play the whole thing uh make a little video tag music yeah. notes in it and uh we'll check that out we might even be able to share it or something like absolutely that. cool. yeah please tag us yeah totally um, well, cool. Well, hey, good luck with the teaching stuff. I know how. Thank you. That's kind of where we started. We went off on some tangents. Well, I'll definitely but... be coming to you for any, <laughs> oh, sure. any I mean, advice after your... I remember about it anymore. But uh, yeah, no, it's it's I say it to every teacher I talk to. It's very, very noble. I mean, really, people need it. People need it. These yeah. kids, these kids got to it needs to be prioritized with people. They need to be they need to be taught how to do this. And the more that they work yeah. at it, the the smarter they're going to be as they get older. For sure. They yeah. need to be taught and and encouraged, I think, by, you know, a, a 
a music teacher because right. it's really easy to, I mean, there's so many resources now to just like learn by yourself on YouTube yeah, or exactly. stuff, but I think there's so much value into having an instructor that's like dedicated to your progress right, and to helping right. you out. Well, no matter I'm what firm, age you are. Sorry. Yeah. I was just going to say, I'm a firm believer in assessment and feedback. Totally. Like yeah. as far as someone trying to learn, that's, that's what I found most valuable was yeah. having somebody who knew how to do what I want to know how to do assess how well I'm doing and give me feedback on yeah, how to improve to like, help exactly that, that made a huge difference for me and I tend to believe it does for most people definitely yeah yeah all right cool all right well uh, we should get back to the office here but all right see y'all next time yeah sounds good <laughs> bye-bye